Hello and welcome to Culture Shock. Yes. Today's subject is the history of samurai and samurai. ronin. Yeah. And ronin. So we're going to talk about samurai and how they evolved over time. Uh, we're not going to go into too much detail into things like the code of the warrior or the swords they carried and so forth. But this is going to talk about the history of what a samurai was and how that changed over time and why there aren't any samurai anymore. Hmm. So it started uh, many centuries ago with this idea of samurai as they're basically as members of certain military clans at the imperial court. Uh, throughout Japanese history, there have been several clans that have always vied for power hmm. around the imperial court. And several of them were explicitly military um, uh, as time went on. And so if you were a samurai, it just meant you were a member of one of these clans. Very, very straightforward. You were basically a warrior. Samurai hmm. meant warrior who goes out, goes out and fights on a battlefield. Hmm. Pretty straightforward. And then we evolve into uh, what's called the Warring States period. Um, and uh, the Warring States period in Japan was a period uh, uh, from the mid-1400s to the 1603, I think. Uh, uh, also called the Sengoku Jidai, the Warring States mm. period. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of states that were at war. Makes sense. The Warring States period. Warring States <laughs> period. Um, and so, of course, during that period, you need a lot of warriors. And so instead of just being a member of these clans, you can become a samurai by proving yourself oh. by going out into battle and being a, a proud warrior, a fierce warrior. They would kind of adopt you into the clan, if you will. Mm. Um, this meant it was very easy to become a samurai at, the, um, at that period uh, because there was no necessarily formal test. You just had to be brave. Mm. And of course, because there were so many wars going on, they wanted lots of these people. Yeah. <laughs> so, great, you did something cool. Come, come on in. Great, sure, that's fine. Um, However, because it was also such a, uh, a time of change mm. and people uh, living and dying, um, this meant a lot of uh, lords would, were dying and, mm. and, and clans were falling apart, which led to a lot of samurai that did not have a, a lord. They were not mm. allied to a particular clan. Uh, their, their clan or their part of the clan had kind of fallen apart. Mm. Um, so y you can think of a clan, you've got the, the head of the clan, and then you've got the, a, a local prefectural lord for a particular prefecture that the, the clan uh, is responsible for. And a, a clan might control a few prefectures or many of them. Mm. And then it might go down to an individual town level and a lord of the town. So if you're a samurai, you are sworn to uh, protect one of those lords somewhere in the hierarchy. If the, your local lord is killed by whatever means, mm. what happens to you? Well, you become a ronin. Hmm. And this means basically a masterless samurai, a samurai that does not have anyone to whom they've sworn allegiance. Um, the reason they could do this is because samurai by this point had a clearly defined social role. They were already great warriors, um, but they had to get their money somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they had to become bodyguards, mercenaries, bounty hunters, assassins, anything that would kind of work. Um, if you've seen movies like, um, what would be good examples, uh, The Seven Samurai, would be a classic mm. example of this. Um, um, a lot of uh, Akira Kurosawa's uh, samurai movies are set in this period about samurai who are wandering around, mm -hmm. who are essentially ronin, who need some way to survive. Uh, if you've seen the anime series Ruroni Kenshin, the Ruroni in there refers to ronin. He is a ronin. So you have all these samurai around and all these ronin around. Uh, Ronin running around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, this became kind of a problem hmm. because you have all these samurai who are, well, in any government, the people with the weapons are the most dangerous, right? Mm. And unemployed. Uh, exactly. That creates its own trouble. Totally. So um, around the late 1500s, that changed uh, in a couple of ways. One is that you could only be samurai if you were part of the samurai caste. So if you were a samurai up to that point, you were now a samurai, um, but you couldn't just prove yourself in battle to become a samurai. It was basically a hereditary position. Oh, wow. So at that point, was it important to trace your lineage to say, look, I've come from a long line of samurai. Certainly. I am, therefore, a samurai, and here it is in this scroll. Mm -hmm. I'm this generation of... Yeah, absolutely. And folks would actually um, uh, compare lineages, and that was a big part of who you were and who you proved to be. 
Now, also during this period, um, and during the entire period, there was this evolution of what it meant to be a samurai and mm. developing a code of the samurai, code of the warrior, which we now call Bushido. Mm. And uh, much of that came from a, a man by the name of Miyamoto Musashi, you probably heard of. Uh, didn't he write the book, The Five Rings? Yes, he did. Um, and that was a book to sort of codify what he believed was the, the way of the samurai, how a samurai should act. And that became one of the sort of foundational texts for this, this code of behavior, code of conduct for samurai. And if, again, as you can imagine, on the one hand, you know, you're trained to fight, you're a warrior, you need some structure for that, you need some way of doing that. Also understand, a samurai's weapon was one of the, well, actually was still considered the sharpest blade ever invented by man. Hmm. Nothing sharper. It's, it's still today we're amazed by Absolutely. the um, manufacture of these. It, it's unbelievable. Um, so when you have a blade that's sharp, you don't get slashed three times. If somebody hits you with one of those blades, that goes right through you. So if you're dueling somebody, you have to not immediately collapse when you're just facing against the, that opponent that has a blade that as soon as it gets anywhere near you is going to probably give you a mortal wound. Um, Bushido, and, well, being a samurai requires a certain physical and mental fortitude mm. that other things do not. Um, there is a strong psychological element to samurai battles. It's why in, in Japanese films so often, when you see a standoff between two samurai, they stand there for a long time. Very intense. Very intense, because you don't get a second chance. You know, there is no second chance. Yeah. You, you have to be prepared <laughs> to win or die. Exactly. And, and, and that was the reality of sword fight, fighting for, for samurai, is that you would have, you would have um, sample bouts with wooden swords and things mm -hmm. like that, where you'd have multiple, multiple hits. But the idea was, um, you know, if you were really going up in battle, those were very brief battles once you actually crossed swords. Mm -hmm. um, so you had to completely judge your opponent, what your, your opponent was going to do when you went into to fight. Whew. So this is why Bushido was so important. You needed a mm -hmm. code of conduct. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this, um, this era, and then you have the 1500s with the, uh, what became what's called the Edo era. And that lasted until the mid-1800s, actually, so several centuries. Hmm. And this is a time of peace. Hmm. So there were no warring states. There were you know, little battles and conflicts and squabbles and such. But no civil wars during this period at a large scale. Uh, when you see the sort of classic Japanese traditional countryside, hmm. you know, peasants in you know, the, that, the peasant clothing and hmm. samurai trotting around and lords and so forth, that's almost always the Edo era. It's considered one of, the, one of the two golden eras of Japanese history. Um, everything was at peace, everyone kind of knew what they were doing, all that kind of stuff. Um, and during that period, again, if you were a samurai, it's because you had a lineage. Hmm. You were born into it, or you were adopted into the family. Oh. So if, say, I was a samurai and I didn't have any children, oh. I, either my lineage dies out, or I adopt somebody. Well, the importance of keeping the name going now. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if I am from an important lineage. I don't want that to die out. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it became common for samurai to adopt folks into their family to keep the, the, mm. the line going. And you would adopt somebody in, they might be 20 years old when you're adopting them mm -hmm. in. Um, that was a good idea, actually, because you could see their maturity level. You could, they had shown how they had grown up. You weren't just grabbing some, you know, punk kid, <laughs> frankly. Um, so, Edo era, peace. Everything's all well and good. Um, but they still carry the, the, the sword? Yes. So, and you've seen this uh, often. You see the long sword and the short sword, yeah. right? Um, and again, I'm not going into, into the details there, but that, those had evolved as the classic weapons. Uh, those were what samurai would wear. So think of them as like the, uh, the six-shooter for a cowboy. Uh, you yeah. know, a cowboy can certainly fire a rifle or whatever, but that six shooter is what they got with them they all the time. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> right. So that, that is your, your standard weapon. Um, and that, it would be all, also similar to if a knight's going out, their armor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going out to battle, if you're going out to do something, that's what you put on. Um, so you have these. And also, and again, um, full props to Japanese sword makers, 
these swords will last for centuries. Mm. So they're handed down wow. from samurai to samurai over time. Um, but imagine what it's like in a time of peace. Um, there's not a lot of conflict, and you have all these samurai around. Uh, but their whole purpose of being samurai is to deal with conflict. Right. To yeah. fight. <laughs> and they, they have this Bushido code. And they're trained in this kind of intense... Um, um, ability to 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 live with conflict, mm. uh, and, and it's very stressful conflict. So what do they do? What, what, what would you imagine would happen to samurai in that in that? In that? I would figure they'd get into trouble. They sure would, <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Um, a lot of the depictions of samurai at the time and the descriptions of them were as arrogant. Um, mm. They got very full of themselves, partly because laws were different for samurai. A samurai could kill a peasant out of hand. Um, completely legally for anything the peasant did, basically. Wow. Um, so it was, it was a very different time. It's going to make the things. peasants both respect, fear, and hate samurai all Absolutely. in the same. Ooh. Yeah, and you have lords now. We, okay, you know you're a lord with all these samurai. How do you keep them in line? They're the ones with all the swords. <laughs> oh wow! You almost have to develop some way of keeping a, another military to keep <laughs> your warriors in. Right. So it became a very touchy subject, and also, you know, with samurai not having much to do, they started evolving other pursuits. Hmm. So um, they get into poetry, they get into writing, they get into politics, things along those lines. Um, as a result, the samurai, as a warrior, began to degrade. Is a reasonable term for it? Just. Hmm. They weren't as necessary as they used to be, so they weren't warriors all the time. That's just not yeah. what they did. Um, so the job description kind of changed, but that also meant that there was this strong tension between being a samurai and actually living being a samurai. Yeah, I, I could almost see somebody who's several generations separated from, from battle not uh, having the same skill set <laughs> if they've been concentrating on writing or something in yeah. the political arena being a bureaucrat or especially if you are the adopted son of the adopted son of the adopted son oh, wow. of a samurai <laughs> you know it's been a complicated <laughs> couple centuries you know things, things change um, but then of course something happened in the 1860s uh, which is very important for Japan hmm. which was the arrival of Commodore Perry and uh, we Americans you know, often get that in, in our schools oh Commodore Perry arrived in his ships um, and so he came in, and as you remember, yeah, he came in, and we, what was his... Well, he came in to open up the ports because mm -hmm. trade had been blocked with uh, Japan at that point, and uh, very little trade with anybody from the West was going on at all without mm -hmm. uh, very special uh, permissions uh, from, I believe, the emperor, was it? Um, or was the it shogun, the actually. Shogun, well, the, shogun. the government in general. The government, yeah. There, yeah. But, but very little... So so little to the point where the U.S. felt that it was important to reopen mm -hmm. uh, trade relations in a forceful manner. Yes. So. Um, and you know, notably, and I think as school children, we don't really think about the fact that Admiral Perry arrived with these gunships. They were gunships for a reason. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they were a, a show of force. Um, so when Admiral Perry arrived, so... Uh, you've heard of the emperor and the shogun. So the emperor was the hereditary ruler of Japan. Mm -hmm. The shogun was the military leader who came from one of these powerful clans. Mm -hmm. And um, he was the sort of practical leader. He was the one with, um, who was really running the country. Mm -hmm. The emperor lived in Kyoto, which was the traditional cap capital, whereas the shogun um, uh, controlled the country from Tokyo, which was the more modern capital, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, Admiral Perry arrives in Tokyo Harbor, and he, the Shogun is the one who signs the treaty with the Americans, saying, "Yes, we will open our, our ports to you." Oh, you can come in as long as you're coming <laughs> over here. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, he didn't consult the emperor. He didn't do anything. Oh, surprise! <laughs> yes. Now, if, if I recall correctly, he he did send a message to the emperor, and then went ahead with it, with whatever he's going to do anyway. I mean, wow. he wasn't going to wait. Um, and so here is where history kind of um, gets a little murky in the sense of, um, of intent. Hmm. Historians generally believe that the Shogun had no choice. Hmm. You know, the Shogun see this, saw this 
massively technologically advanced military force. I think force. it was a steamship at that point. It, Not it was. just a sailboat. Exactly, but, yeah. And gun, guns <laughs> mounted. Yes, these huge cannons. new cans. technology there is. Totally. Um, and so, um, and, and even more worryingly, like, I mean, there had been there had been cannons in Japan for a long time from China and so forth, and it hadn't developed anywhere near what they had in America. Um, so, the Shogun realized we can't just refuse; they'll just batter the port open, and that had happened in the past. Um, hmm. uh, Portuguese and, and Dutch ships, when there were issues, would just come in and just start firing cannons at the ports. Wow! Uh, it was certainly possible for that to happen. So the shogun basically said, I don't care what the emperor says, we've got to do this anyway. That was seen in Kyoto and amongst a lot of the um, imperial loyalists as essentially a power grab on the part of the shogun. Oh. The shogun was now finally doing something um, to usurp power from the emperor. Hmm. Um, so this schism ar arose and this desire for rebellion to defeat the shogun and put the emperor back in control of the country. Bringing about a civil, civil war very much a civil war. It was called the Boshin War. Hmm. And uh, it was in the 1860s in Japan. The revolutionaries, granted, had some really crazy ideas. For example, they were going to set Kyoto on fire. Yeah. And in the confusion, grab the emperor and take him to Tokyo to put him on the, the throne there and in power there. Um, never mind the huge civilian loss of life if that would happen. Setting um, a, a whole city on fire sounds like a very radical idea. And we're talking wooden houses everywhere, yes. not brick, <laughs> exactly. not steel, not... I it, mean, just maybe a castle or two, but everybody's pretty much wood houses. That, and and that, that was the, the other kind of crazy thing, is that um, the people that would be hurt the most were not the emperor, not anyone else. They were the poor people. The, the living people. In the, exactly. <laughs> um, and, I mean, th this is a country that was deathly afraid of, you know, any kind of fire. I mean, mm. it, it, was, it was horribly devastating. So, um, the Shogun assembled this group of people called the Shinsengumi, mm. uh, uh, which I believe literally means the new core, the, mm. the, the, the new group. And they were basically a crack team of elite samurai who were sent to Kyoto to quell the rebellion. The special forces. Exactly. <laughs> um, if you've seen Ghost in the Shell, Section 9 is a science fiction equivalent of the Shinsengumi. Hmm. Uh, and there are a few... The elite of the elite. <laughs> yeah, and there are a few references back to the Shinsengumi, which you know, indicate that's, that's where he was going with that. So, um, similar kind of thing. You know, they're brought in to, to, to resolve these problems. Um, and on the one hand, they did stop a lot of those more radical um, plots. Hmm. But because the Shinsengumi, a lot of them were uh, adopted in, they believed very strongly in these, in the Code of Bushido. And so they would, they would say things like, um, it, they agreed on, on, a, on a rule that if you violated Bushido in any way, you had to commit seppuku in front of the entire Shinsengumi. Seppuku. Meaning ritual suicide. Suicide. You had to kill yourself in front of everyone. Oh, wow. The next day. That's pretty harsh. Very harsh. Um, in and, front of everybody. Yes. Um, and for the smallest infraction. Ooh. You name it. So... On the one hand, um, this did create a strong desire for virtue. On the other hand, that was a very easy system to, in which to um, manipulate. It's, it's a discipline that, wow, it's so strict. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were, there were very early on cases where elite members of the Shinsengumi, if they didn't like somebody, would find some way in which they had you violated, have violated Bushido. Bushido. Yeah. Now you must kill suicide. yourself in front of everybody. Wow. Yeah. So it, it's a beautiful symbol for how the samurai class was kind of collapsing. Hmm. They had this strong belief in this warrior code that was very inflexible. Hmm. And society was changing. Culture was changing. With revolutionaries trying to set fire and exactly. new and technology coming in on the ports. And precisely. It was just... Um, uh, it, it was a noble thing for the wrong time. Hmm. And so while they did have initial success, they couldn't stop history. Um, eventually the Shogun actually stepped down. Uh, a new clan but member... But they were fighting for. Exactly, yes. He just uh, abdicated. Wow. 
Um, and of course, the power gap was immediately you know filled. But um, uh, the Shinsengumi were then essentially hounded to death. A lot of them died in battle. A lot of them had to commit seppuku. And uh, many of them were just accused of crimes, of war crimes, and mm -hmm. then executed you know, after the war. So the Shinsengumi really collapsed. And it was, it was considered really the last great hurrah of the samurai. Uh, were they at that point then considered ronin until somebody stepped in? Or did they try and come underneath of the so authority? That's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, as I recall, once the shogun, well, they were different because they were formed by the shogun as his elite group. Okay. So they were essentially government employees in that sense. Um, so it didn't really matter who was shogun they're, because they're they, still they, they were they're still in there. Trouble for <laughs> but the, um, the way the politics worked is that because they no longer had that um, that mandate from that particular person. Well, now who are we getting orders from? Yeah, you know, is it the new person and all that kind of stuff? And then, of course, the way their clan ended up as a result of that, because they were all from a specific clan that was sort of given for this. So how that end up with the mm -hmm. politics complicated things further. Cool. Um, but yeah, it, you know, essentially the Shinsengumi collapsed as this this uh, this continued. And there were certainly samurai after that. There were people in in of samurai family. And to this day, mm -hmm. you can go to Japan, go to um, uh, a house. Uh, one of these old samurai houses, and it might be open to the public, and you may get a tour from somebody who says, I'm actually technically a samurai. Wow. You know, I, <laughs> I can trace my lineage all the way back. I am a member of the samurai family. Um, he will wear, you know, a sweater and, you know, khakis like anyone else. Adopt but, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, so the families are still there, but mm. in t um, as warriors, as anything other than just having this title, mm. um, it's really gone away. Wow, so so that was pretty much the end of the whole samurai. Mm. Wow, this that spread quite a quite a period of time. The development all the way through, from yeah. beginning to end. Well, and years. for all practical purposes. Yeah. <laughs> Except for giving tours now. Right. So, exactly. So the yeah. last samurais are giving tours. Yes, <laughs> ab absolutely, they are. And and again, it's a good a good example of a role in society that is very important for a while, and then suddenly society doesn't need you anymore, and you may still have the title but you don't have the role. Wow. And, uh, yeah. So th there's a lot more about samurai to talk about, but in terms of the, the big broad sweep, that's how things change. The changing sands of time and the forces mm -hmm. of history. Yeah. The Japanese love their stories about the nobility of failure, about uh, things where people tried their best and failed utterly. <laughs> and uh, the Shinsengumi is a great example of that, and samurai in general, where, you know, you're just pitted against the, the, the tides of time. Wow. Yeah. So that's... That's basically Samurai. Well, that, that was a lot to cover in a short period of time. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's more details. Much more. But uh, we can cover that and some of the other topics at another point in the future. You bet. But uh, for now, this has been Culture Shock. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>